Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. A welcome to the Islamic Broadcasting Network, IBN TV8. Today, inshallah, um, my name is Zahir Ali. I'm the secretary of the Islamic Dawa movement, and we have a very interesting program for you all today titled Popular Questions About Islam. We know that Muslims, Islam, is in the headlines around the world. And everyone, including myself, I, I come across co-workers, friends, even the family members who have a lot of questions about Islam. So today, the objective of our program is to answer some of these questions. And I have a special guest with me here today. He is a resident of, of United States. He hails from Chicago. And he is the director of Gain Peace, which is the Dawa arm of the Islamic Circle of North America, ICNA. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Sabil Ahmad. Assalamu alaikum, Doc. Wa alaikum salam, Welcome to Trinidad again for the second time. Alhamdulillah, good to be here. Of course, and we're always pleased to have you here. So, Doc, so tell us a bit about Gain Peace, the organization you work with. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Wa na'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbish rahli sadri, wa yassilli amri, wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani, yafqahu khawli. So Gain Peace is a dawa outreach organization. We work on three fronts. We want to empower our own Muslims and remind them that dawa or sharing of Islam is an obligation. Number two, we do dawah to non-Muslims using one-to-one -one conversations, using billboards, TV, radio, open house messages. Number three, for those people who embraced Islam by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we help them, we mentor them so they could be uh, vibrant members of the society. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, so I have the correct man for the job here today, you, to answer these questions. So, inshallah, let's get straight into it. Okay, so one of the questions that a lot of people ask, we say that Islam is a religion. Islam, we say that Islam is about 1400 years old. We use that as a timeline. So many non-Muslims, even Muslims, they, know, they think that Islam is a new faith. It was the last faith after Christianity. How do you respond to that question? Yes, so there is a misconception that Islam is a new faith that was started 1400 years ago, and they think that first came Hinduism, then Jainism, then Judaism, then Christianity, and then Islam. But historically, when we look at it, Alhamdulillah, Islam is the first and the only faith that our Creator has given as a guidance for all of humanity. For example, it says in the Quran, chapter number 42, verse number 13, that the same way of life, the same ideology given to you, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was also given to Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Right? So it's very important the Quran testifies to it. Number two, the Quran says about Abraham, peace be upon him, chapter 3, verse number 67, that he, he was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was a Muslim, Muslim. Hanif as a Muslim, right? Regarding Jesus, peace be upon him, the Quran says in chapter 3, verse number 51, Jesus is quoted in the Quran as saying that, Inna Allah rabbi wa rabbukum fa'budu haza sirata mustaqeem. That verily Allah is my Lord and your Lord, worship him alone, and that is the right path. So the Quranic evidence is that, yes, Islam was given to the very first human, Adam, peace be upon him. The rest of the prophets, they also receive the same basic ideology that they should worship one creator and not the creation. So in that sense, Islam is the first and the only faith. Now, some people in the time of prophets, they followed the path of Islam, but some people, they deviated from that path and formed their own religions or own way of life and diluted who God is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God by His mercy, appointed prophet after prophet to all the nations, as the Quran mentions in Surah 16, Ayah 36, that the prophets and the messengers were sent to warn the people that do not worship the creation, but worship the creator, to bring those people back again to the right path. 
So when we look at from that perspective, Islam is the first and the only faith. All the prophets and the messengers, including Jesus, peace be upon him, he submitted to Allah and he is a Muslim, just like all the prophets. So to conclude, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of Islam. He did not initiate Islam. Islam as a way of life was given by Allah to the very first human, Adam, peace be upon him. So I hope that makes it clear, Quranic evidence and historical evidence. And that seems rational too. Of course. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to give contradictory messages to different prophets. That to Prophet A, Allah is not going to say to, it's okay to worship idols. To Prophet B, it's okay to worship a man, Jesus, for example. And then to Prophet C, that is wrong, only worship one God. One God. Humanity would be confused, don't you think so? Of course, of course, most definitely. Consistent message, one message, one faith, Islam, submission to one God. MashaAllah. Yes. Big question. Jihad. Wow. Jihad. Hot topic right hot away. Hot topic, <laughs> hot topic right away. We say, if someone asks me what Islam means, now we know it has many meanings, and one of the meanings is peace. But again, in the media, we, we, we hear the word jihad, jihad is holy war associated. How do we reconcile Islam being a religion of peace and the word jihad, holy war? Okay, that's a very good question, by the way. People have this uh, notion that jihad means uh, holy war, killing of the infidels, subjugating women, uh, forcefully converting people. So when you look at Islam, Islam is a faith of peace. Islam wants to create justice in the society and the outcome of justice is peace. So sometimes to establish justice, there has to be some police force, some military force and almost all the countries, they have it. The reason countries have that is because they want harmony and peace in the society. Not that those countries are war mongers, that they want to fight and violence. The reason police force is there and military force is there, so there could be proper checks and balance in the society. In the same way, since the aim of Islam is to bring justice to the society, sometimes some kind of a fighting and some kind of a check and balance is needed. So that's where jihad comes into the picture. So jihad means struggling within oneself and struggling in the society so you could bring justice and peace in the society. There are four quick examples of jihad, by the way, so our viewers could uh, really understand the bigger concept of jihad. And it's easy to remember, there are four S's. S, 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 S. The very first S is self-improvement. So the very first form of jihad is self-improvement. Means if some, somebody, suppose, if he smokes or backbites or doesn't come on time to work, Use it using bad language, for example. Now the person would like to better himself or herself. So that struggle the person has to go through to give up the bad habits, inculcate good habits, that struggle, that concept is called jihad in Islam. The second S would be society. How to better the society. Means as a Muslim, my assignment and the assignment of all the Muslims is to indulge in the society and enhance the society. For example, suppose if uh, people are having awareness about breast cancer, about autism, about against poverty, against suicide, you join forces with the good-hearted people, good-minded people. You spend your time, your money, your resources. So that struggle that you go through to make the society better is jihad in Islam. The third form of jihad the third S is self-defense. For example, suppose if a country in South America is trying to invade your country, your land, your property, or trying to compromise you in person or your family, God has given a right for all of us to defend ourselves. For example, at 2 a.m. in the morning, you hear a bang on the door, and you look and you see that there are some gang bangers out there, bad people out there with cricket bats trying to harm you and family. You are not going to open the door, would you? You make sure that you pick up something so you could defend yourself. So Allah says in the Quran, chapter number 2, verse number 190,
that fight in the cause of God, for those who impose war, those who fight against you. But even in that self-defense, do not go to extreme because Allah does not love the extremist. So it's very important, even in the defensive war, to defend ourselves, we cannot harm or kill the innocent of the enemy. So that's how important Islam wants us to fight within the etiquettes of war. And the last S would be to save lives. Isn't that awesome? It says in the Quran, chapter 4, verse number 75, that why don't you fight in the cause of Allah for those people who are oppressed? And they are crying to Allah that, oh Allah, remove the oppression, send somebody for us who could help us. So if we see oppression going on anywhere, we should be joining with good-hearted people to remove the oppression and save lives. So this is what jihad means. So in jihad, you cannot harm or kill innocent people. Jihad is not holy war, by the way, because holy war in Arabic language, it is harb mukhaddasa. Harb mukhaddasa, that term holy war, does not occur anywhere in the entire Quran. It does not occur anywhere in the 52,000 authentic narrations from and about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Jihad is not subjugation of women because uh, Islam is against subjugation of women. Jihad is not forcefully converting people because the Quran says in chapter 2, verse number 256, La there is no compulsion in faith. Jihad is not uh, forcefully uh, taking the rights of the minorities. So just in case some people somewhere in the world may be using the term jihad or Sharia law or Arabic terminology and misusing those terminologies to create oppression and do violence and extremism, they're going against the clear-cut teachings of Islam and jihad. So at the end of the day, jihad means that struggle that you want to have within yourself and in the society to make yourself better and the society better peacefully, proactively, positively. That's what jihad means. So in a nutshell, my jihad every day mm -hmm. would be to be, would be, to be a, a better husband, a better son, a better brother to my community. That, that should be my daily hijab, jihad. A better neighbor. A better neighbor. Muhammad, yeah. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he mentioned that you're not a believer if you eat your full and your neighbors are hungry. That means I have to look out for my neighbor. I have to spend the time to know what could be the needs of the neighbors. So me spending time connecting with them, socializing with them, helping them, me helping my neighbors is also jihad. MashaAllah. Yes, alhamdulillah. But they can counteract with another question that why it is that we see that most terrorists, and you know, we, we know the term terrorist is a very open and closed terminology. It applies conveniently to, to situations. But people will say that most Muslims mm -hmm. are, ter are terrorists. Like, for example, we have this global issue of ISIS and extremism. You know, how would you reconcile that also? All right, so that's an important question and misconception. In the USA, in America, the question goes like this, that not every Muslim is a terrorist, but every terrorist is a Muslim, right? You may have heard that kind of phrasing of that question. Yes. But that's a misnomer, by the way. It's very important. If we study the, the statistics around the world and within Trinidad, and especially in the Western countries, the statistics, they show otherwise. The statistics they show, and I'll give you one example, Brother Zaheer. In 2015, in the USA, there were 365 incidents of mass shootings. Right? One every day. Almost every day, one yeah. every day, right? And that's so, so sad. Out of them, only three, they were attributed to the Muslims. So out of the 365 acts of terrorism in the USA in last year, only three. But when I say only three, every single one, we should cry. Of course. Of course. Because life is precious. Every soul is sacred. Every drop of blood is important and equal. So I'm saying only three just to show the disparity between 365 and three. To show that, yes, even in the bigger scheme of violence in the USA, 
Muslims are so misguided, they're good and bad in the followers of any faith. So there are some misguided Muslims who are committing some atrocities, but not to the extent in which some people are attributing. Right? In, in Europe, less than 2% of the acts of terrorism are done by Muslims in the name of Islam. But sometimes the media shows, when they show the wall-to-wall -wall coverage, when an incident happens, they have the wall-to-wall -wall coverage that Muslims have done that. They want to study, you know, who made this person radical. And uh, then they go on and on. So the perception that is created in the eyes of people watching the news is that every act of terrorism is done by Muslims. The perception that is the perception, created. Yeah. You know, what about Jim Jones? 800, 900 people in the name of Christianity. Okay. What about uh, Andre Brovik? In 2012, 78 people, he right. bombed and he shot people in Norway. Correct. And he's also w winning his legal b battle. I know. Berwick. Amazing. What about KKK? KKK. What about the Catholic priest who abused so many children? So it's very important. It's very important for me, you, and the Muslims not to judge Christianity by the heinous acts done by Christians in the name of Christianity. The crusaders, the slave traders, the inquisition, the colonial powers. I tell to my Muslims that do not judge Christianity but the actions of these misguided Christians in the same way. No one sh should and can judge Islam, which is a faith of peace, faith of but peace. the actions of a few misguided Muslims. But if someone would like to know what Islam is, uh, Fox News is not a source. <laughs> This is the source, the Quran, the word of Allah, the word of God, and the noble example of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yes, mashallah. Another question: Women in Islam. Okay, that's a big jump. <laughs> a big jump, you know. Right. It's a big jump, but <clears throat> they say that Islam oppresses, oppresses women. But we know otherwise. Explain. All right. Uh, in the USA, when they have taken the survey by USA Today polling, they found out that the number one misconception people have about Islam is about women in Islam. So if my friends, my Christian, Jewish, Hindu friends, if they ask me this question, that is it true that Islam suppresses women? I ask them a counter question, and this would be the counter question. What makes you think so? Most of the time they have the answer that, you know, we saw Fox News, we saw uh, some TV radio program, or we uh, saw something in the social media. <laughs> so most of the time, unfortunately, people judge Islam by the actions of some cultural practices or the actions of some misguided Muslims. So it's very important we should separate the actions of some misguided people from the pure gold standard, which is the Quran. Quran. So when we look at women in Islam, it's important that before Islam came to Arabia, most, uh, women, they were mistreated big time. They did not have any rights. Sometimes they were married and discarded, treated as property, treated as sex objects. To such an extent that sometimes the baby girls they were buried alive. That's the height of darkness that people were before Islam came to Arabia. But after Islam came, Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah. Islam uplifted the status of women equal to man in the eyes of God, chapter 33, verse number 35 and onwards. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that men and women, they are like twins. Means equality in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Different roles, but equal reward. When it comes to uh, the wonderful rights that Islam gave to women, I mean, the viewers may be surprised to find out that Western women, they have to suffer and fight and sacrifice to win the rights that they have now, that we take for granted. Islam in the 7th century, alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah, liberated women by giving them humongous rights. For example, right to own property, 
we take it for granted. I mean, my wife can go and buy a car if she wants to, correct? But in the USA, not until 1861, in the state of Illinois, Western women, especially married women, they were given the right to own property. Before that, they could not have. Islam gave that right in the seventh century. When I got married, the clerk, she asked the question to my wife. So what should I change your last name to? She was asking my wife, right? My wife was not happy at her. She said, why would you like to change my last name? Change his last name, right? <laughs> <laughs> Islam gave women the right to keep their last names. I mean, why, why does she have to change? Why not the husband, right? So equality is there. Number three, Islam gave women the right to inherit property or to inherit the wealth of their deceased loved ones. Islam gave women the right to gain education. So if anyone is stopping them from gaining education, they're going against the teachings of Islam. So Brother Zaheer and my fellow viewers would be surprised to find out that women all throughout history, because of this right, they were movers and shakers and scholars and leaders of the society. One example, the oldest continuous university on the face of this earth, according to the Guinness Book of World Records and according to the, uh, according to, to the United Nations, was built in 859 CE in the country of Morocco, in the city of Fez, by a Muslim lady wearing the hijab. Her name was Fatima al fahri And the name of the campus, the university, University of Karawayin. Way before Oxford and Harvard and Penn State and the University of West Indies, right? <laughs> Muslim women were the ones building hospitals and pharmacies and universities. And that's how Islam liberated them and empowered them. Yes. MashaAllah. Some information there. I'm sure I learned something new and I'm sure our viewers will learn something new. Sticking on the, the, the part of, of women, men are allowed to marry how, how many? Four wives. In up, Islam. Up to up four. Up to four wives. Up to four. Up to four wives. Important a disclaimer there. In Islam. <laughs> and this is a hot topic here in Trinidad, and I'm sure in the United States. Mm -hmm. But then some ask why it is that men are allowed to marry four wives, but women are not allowed to marry four husbands. Where, where is the equality? All right. So first, let's address the topic of why men are allowed up to four. Okay, important. You know, it seems like that's one of the topics, especially when I come to South America in the outreach tour, this topic is hot. But in Canada, USA, Europe, uh, I'm hardly asked this question, by the way. Interesting. Interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. So it says in the Quran, chapter number four, verse number three, that marry two, three, or up to four. But if you cannot do justice, marry only one. So that so the concept of polygamy or polygyny, which is the proper term, Islam did not invent that, by the way. Even before, well, we cannot say before Islam, but in other scriptures, in other cultures, polygamy always existed. India, there is polygamy, unrestricted polygamy. A Hindu can marry any number of wives, legally, technically, right? And according to their scriptures, there is no restriction. In the Old Testament, there are no restrictions like King Solomon, I mean, we don't take it, but the Bible says in the first Kings, Old Testament, this is a book. King Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Almost all the prophets of the Old Testament, they had more than one wife. Prophet Abraham and Moses and Jacob and the rest of the prophets, peace be upon them. There is no prohibition in the Old Testament by the God of the Old Testament that marrying more than one is prohibited. There is no such statement. New Testament, Jesus, peace be upon him, he also allowed. And he approved the laws of the Old Testament. Uh, Gospel of Matthew, the very first Gospel, chapter 5, verse number 17, 18, and 19. Jesus said, peace be upon him, I came not to destroy the law or the prophets, I came to fulfill. Means he's approving all the laws of the Old Testament. So now the point is, Islam did not invent polygamy. Right? Number one. Number two, Islam restricted polygamy. Unrestricted polygamy before Islam, but Islam came. They're up to four, but if you cannot do justice, if you cannot maintain them, 
give them proper time, proper shelter, proper food, proper basic needs, then you, you should not marry. You cannot marry. Marry only one. To look at the beauty of God's guidance. So it's very important that uh, when I'm asked this question, suppose in Chicago, they have taken a survey in Chicago by Chicago Tribune newspaper, third largest newspaper in the USA. And according to that survey, an average American male in their lifetime, they have seven, up to seven, or maybe seven girlfriends. So the Western culture is okay to have as many girlfriends, as many mistresses, and as many extra marital affairs. But when it comes to Islam, within the mode of marriage, proper checks and balances and responsibilities, people have objections. See, in the Western culture, a person could get Without marriage, they could have children. And then the dad may run away, and the poor lady has to raise by herself, right? Where is the justice to the lady? Islam gave justice and responsibility and the home to every single person. So that's the beauty of Islam, by the way, right? MashaAllah. Yeah. MashaAllah. So, but your follow up question was that uh, how come the ladies don't have the right to have more than one correct, husband, yes. right? So when you ask this question to a lady that would you desire to have more than one husband? I don't think any lady would say yes. <laughs> but there are logistical problems in having more than one husband because in the Islamic system or in almost all the families which are out there, right? Whether it be Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Hindu, a uh, man is the head of the household. It would be a logistical problem if a household has four heads. You know, I mean, logically, if the husband wa wants, uh, one husband wants the wife that night for reason, right? What about hu other husbands? There would be fight. Of course. Of course, correct? A school cannot have four principals. A country cannot have four prime ministers. There would be fight, there would be friction, and it will not be harmony. So Allah, God, by his wisdom, have given males up to four with justice. Cannot do justice? marry only one. Islam is the only faith that says marry only one if you cannot do justice. All the other faiths and cultures unrestricted wives without proper checks and balances. MashaAllah. That's a you know interesting answer and I hope it cleared up a lot of the misconceptions. Inshallah. Because again in internal that it's a big question. It's a big question. So our book, the book that we have as Muslims is the Quran. Everyone else claims their book is authentic as well as, as Muslims. Yeah. How can we prove that the Quran is an authentic book of God? Okay, Alhamdulillah. So I wish this question was like one of the first questions, but that is fine. We can still do justice to the question, inshallah. Now, you may have seen me and uh, Brother Zahir, we are quoting from the Quran. But you may be thinking, you know, this is a circular argument. You guys are using the Quran to justify your claims, but how do you know the Quran is the word of God? Every faith says the book is from God. Jews may say Old Testament, Christians may say the Bible, New and Old Testament, Hindus may say the Vedas, and Muslims would say the Quran. Five important points, my dear Muslims and my dear guests. Point number one, the Quran itself says that the author of the Quran is the Lord of the Alameen, means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Chapter 33, verse number 2 mentions that. And you could check this out, by the way. But that, I could write a book and I could say that this book is from God, but at least the Quran says that it is from God. And some of the Christian viewers and Muslims would be surprised to find out that there is no place in the New Testament it says that this New Testament or this Gospel or that letter of Paul or epistle of John is from God. There is no mention in the New Testament that any part of the New Testament is from God. Are you surprised? <laughs> Very much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the Quran says it, number one. Number two, Quran challenges those people that if you don't think, if you don't believe this is from God, why don't you produce a scripture like this? So this challenge was given by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, obviously coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the unbelievers of his time and for all time. Chapter 17, verse number 88 says, that if all the mankind and all the jinns 
would gather together to produce the likeness of the Quran, they would never be able to do it, even if they come together for help and support. So just look at the profound impact of the challenge that a person who is illiterate, did not know how to read and write, is challenging the Shakespeare's of his time in Arabic language. That if this is your book, this is Arabic language, your masters of Arabic language. If you don't believe that this book is from God, or if you're saying that I wrote this book, why don't you produce something like this? Profound, it's a logical challenge. They were not able to do it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced that challenge just to show them that this book is special. Chapter 11, verse number 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced the challenge to write or compose 10 surahs or 10 chapters or sections like the Quranic surahs. They were not able to do it. Masters of the Arabic language. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced the challenge again to one surah, right? So it says in chapter number 2, verse number 23, that if you don't believe what we have given to our slave servant Muhammad, peace be upon him, then produce a surah like the Quranic surah. Do you think they, were, they came and beat, beat the challenge? Of course not. They did not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying to compose something like the biggest surah of the Quran. It could be the smallest surah. And which one is the smallest by the way? Surah Nusr. Surah, surah Al-Kawthar. Al-Kawthar. Yeah. Three, three verses. It only has three ayahs or three verses in there and ten words. Look at the mind-boggling nature of the challenge that all of humanity, all the jinns, with all the supercomputers and the tablets and all the dictionaries, all the scholars combined, they cannot produce 10 words in their eloquency, in their guidance, in their prophecies, in their historical facts, in their scientific facts, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has composed here. So instead of Coming together in a room, the scholars of that time, non-Muslims, to meet and beat and compose something, they started to destroy Islam through fighting. They could have used intellect and their ability as scholarship to beat Quran, to beat Islam or to dismantle Islam. But since they were not able to, they took up arms. A lot of bloodshed, a lot of wars happened, right? So that's a mind-boggling challenge. Proof number two. Proof number three, really quickly. Quran has a prophecy in there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, chapter 15, verse number nine. Inna nazzal zikra wa inna lahu la It is Allah who has sent this message, this Quran. It is Allah who is going to protect it. So we can see that, alhamdulillah, that 1400 plus years have gone by. The prophecy kept on coming to be true. Quran has been protected in the hearts and the minds of people. 10 million people alive right now, Muslims, young and old, rich, poor, male, female, who memorize this whole book. I asked the Pandit last night, or maybe two nights ago, right, in the debate, uh, how many of you have memorized all of the Vedas, or Bhagavad Gita, or Ramayana? No response. In the original language, by the way. Same thing for the Christians. I mean, with all due respect, we have to ask them in a nice, polite way. But Quranic challenge, Quran would be preserved, and we have seen that. 5,000 plus, 500 plus scientific facts in here about how the universe began. Chapter 21, verse number 30. Expansion of the universe. Chapter 51, verse number 47. Shape of the earth as round. Chapter 79, verse number 30 how a baby grows inside the mother's womb, embryology, chapter 21, verse number 20, 13, 14, uh, 12, 13, and 14. So 500 plus scientific facts, zero errors. Man in the seventh century, no technology could not have produced that many. So these and many indications they are there that Muslims don't just blindly believe just because our parents told us this is from God. There's a logical, scientific, historical, prophetic evidence that this book is special, cannot be authored by a human being or human beings or jinns, it is coming from God. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. So as we, as we move along now, Sharia law. All right. Another hot topic Another there. Another hot topic. Wow. <laughs> you know, a lot of 
non-Muslims and even some Muslims who are not aware, they think that sh sh Sharia law is about chopping off the hand, stoning to death, etc., etc., a violent act. Exactly what is Sharia law? Okay, wonderful. So I'm not going to go into the classical linguistic definition of the Sharia law. I will just keep it simple, inshallah. So Sharia law, that the way that I would explain to my family or to the non-Muslims would be, Sharia law is a how-to manual. We have how-to manual when a person enrolls in a school. In USA, maybe over here, there's a how-to guide, student's handbook. When you start driving a car, there's a how-to manual, how to drive. Do you have it here, I guess? Some instructions? You have instruction book. Correct? Yes. Instruction book. So Sharia law is a how-to manual that how humanity should live in peace with the Creator, peace with humanity, and by doing that, how Allah would peacefully, by His mercy, will induct people into eternal paradise. So that's what Sharia law is. It's a how-to manual for humanity how to live in peace with God and with the creation. Now, based on what the media is showing and the perception the media is creating regarding the context of the Sharia law, people think, so what is the very first thing that comes to mind, by the way? I think you mentioned that. Well, well I can give you a story. Okay. I, I asked a, a, um, a non-Muslim, he lives in the US, and uh, we were speaking about Islam, and I asked him, what do you know about the Sharia law? And he automatically did this. Oof. <laughs> his, so his concept is that. He didn't see it, he just did that. Wow, that speaks volumes. Of course it does. Yes. Now, I give this analogy to the people. Suppose if men from Mars, or people from aliens, you know, we, don't, we don't even know if they exist, by the way. Suppose if aliens, they come down to Trinidad, and they ask, uh, Zaheer, you the question. That uh, you know, brother Zaheer. Well, let me see you, brother. So Zaheer, <laughs> what is the Trinidad Constitution all about? And you reply to them that the Constitution, it kills people. Suppose if you say that. And that's all you say, and they leave. Are you doing justice to the Constitution of Trinidad or no, to the U.S.? Not. Of course not. Of course not, because you are leaving out the breadth and the beauty of the Constitution. You are only giving them only the punishment system of the Constitution. Are you not? Yes, I will be doing that, yes. Yeah. What are you leaving out, by the way? I'm, I'm leaving out the, the guidelines of, of living, the, the guidelines of our right to education, our right to... to to, to worship, you know, stuff like that. Because our constitution has that. Yes, you're leaving out uh, wonderful services, wonderful benefits, wonderful way constitution speaks about equality. So you're leaving out like 99% of the constitution. You're only giving them like 1%, which is the justice and the penal system or the punishment system. In the same way, within the breadth and the beauty of the Sharia law or the guidance given by God, less than 0.5% deals with the punishment system. In fact, the viewers would be surprised to find out that out of the 6,000 plus passages or ayahs in the Quran, less than 10 of them speaks about punishment system. That's it, right? Less than 10. Less than 10. So that is like uh, less than 1%, like 0.5%, maybe less than 0.5%. So it's very important. And the rest of the Sharia law deals with like so many wonderful guidances and solutions for humanity and how we should be good neighbors and good parents and uh, good citizens of the country, correct? Of course. So uh, I would say that uh, the guidance or the Sharia law given to Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the only guidance that God gave to humanity in history. The Ten Commandments that our Jewish and the Christian friends that they have in their Bible in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse number 3, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse number 6, the Ten Commandments, worship only one God. Do not make any images of God. Do not lie. Do not cheat. Obey your parents. Uh, be a good neighbor. The Ten Commandments over here, 
we say that possibly that was the Sharia law given by God to Prophet Moses and his people. Sharia law in the Bible, by the way, right? And then the rest of the commandments also in the Bible. Stoning people for certain crimes, yes, it's in the Bible. Chopping of hands is there in the Bible. Book of Deuteronomy, Book of Leviticus and other such places. So the punishment system is also there. Just like Quran has punishment system with proper checks and balances, the punishment system along with other systems mentioned in the Bible, the punishment system is also here. So at the end of the day, Sharia law, and let's just give one or two examples of the Sharia law, by the way, right? Uh, me taking care of my parents is part of the Sharia law. Me indulging in the society to better the society, it's part of the Sharia law. Me giving charity or you giving charity to the poor person on the street, part of the Sharia law. You smiling at other person is part of the Sharia law. You praying and connecting with God is part of the Sharia law. So Sharia law is God's guidance to bring unity, justice, and peace in the society. Somebody could abuse. Anyone could abuse any scripture, right? People have abused, like I give the example of Christianity. Hindus are abusing their scriptures and committing as atrocities. So are the Buddhists, by the way, right? The Buddhist monks in uh, Burma and different places. So it's very important, just in case if you see some people using the term Sharia law and abusing minorities, not giving them the right freedom of uh, religion, suppressing women, Actually, Sharia law came to fight against those atrocities. Sharia law came to do away with terrorism. Actually, jihad and Sharia law is the enemy of terrorism. Sharia law is the, came to fight terrorism. Interesting. Yes, so Sharia law is God's guidance given to the prophets of the past and also present in the Quran. It's not barbaric. It came to unify people and to give justice, equality, and peace to the society. MashaAllah. So we just have a couple more questions, Doc. And, uh, and, and one of it is, m Muslims, they have a pilgrimage they have to perform every year, yeah. if you can afford it and if you have the health to, to Saudi Arabia. And there, there's a, an area called the Kaaba, we know. And the Kaaba looks like a black box. Sure. So, Muslims go there and we pray within that area and we make a tawaf, uh, a circle around that black box. Some people think that we are worshipping the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. What would be you, your response on that? Well, of course, the response is there are 1.6 billion Muslims around the world. Even if you take a child, you know, my eight-year-old, even my three-year-old, by the way, Hey, who do you worship if I ask my son Yusuf? Hey, who do you worship? Do you worship that black stone? He's going to be upset, you know. No, I don't worship a black stone. I worship Allah, the Creator. So there is no Muslim anywhere in the whole world, 1.6 billion, none of them are going to say that we worship Kaaba. So Kaaba is a structure, it's a cubicle structure in Makkah built originally by Abraham and his son, Prophet Ishmael. So that precinct is the first and the oldest house of worship to worship the one creator. So Muslims, when we go there for the pilgrimage, which is one of the five pillars of Islam, by the way, we don't worship Kaaba, but we do certain rituals around the Kaaba. No Muslim is going to bow down to the Kaaba, but we bow down towards the Kaaba. There's a big difference. Suppose if you see a church and people are worshipping and they're facing certain direction. There's a wall in front of them, right? Are they worshipping the wall or they're facing towards the wall? Facing towards the wall. Okay. So the Kaaba, for example, suppose if this is the Kaaba, Muslims around the world for the sake of unity, they all focus. They don't focus, they worship in that direction, right? We're not worshipping the Kaaba. We are forming in a unity. We are, we are worshipping towards the Kaaba, but we are worshipping the Creator. And unlike the Hindus, they bow down to their idols. Unlike the Hindus, they do certain rituals 
to the stone or to the idols. But Muslims, we do not worship the Kaaba, we do not do any rituals uh, taking the Kaaba as something divine. Muslims climb on the Kaaba, by the way, of course. right? And we can uh, repair, repair it. Many times it has been repaired. And it has been broken down and rebuilt. Yeah, rebuilt. Yeah. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, out of the 1.6 billion Muslims, not a single one of them, if you could, it's a challenge, by the way, ask them this question, do you worship the Kaaba? They would laugh at you with all respect, right? So we don't. We don't. It's a misconception. We don't. We worship the Torah. We don't even worship Muhammad, peace be upon him. We, do, we, we don't even take him as the mediator, by the way. God is all-knowing, all-seeing. We worship God directly. And Kaaba is a focal point for all the Muslims to form unity and worship in that direction. Yeah. Not to it, but towards it. Yeah. MashaAllah. So we'll take a break. And when we return, we will have a couple more questions that our respected doctor will answer. So we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to our program, Popular Questions on Islam. We have Dr. Sabil Ahmed with us from Chicago, the director of Gay and Peace of ICNA. So, Doc, so we're going to continue with our questions on Islam. Alhamdulillah, we have had a fruitful first half, now it's the second half. So, let's jump straight into it. Hijab ban, niqab ban. Even Burkini ban, okay. right? Everything. But the main word here is hijab, right? And, and hijab is associated more with sisters. Explain. What, what is hijab? So our Muslims themselves and non-Muslim public will understand better. Okay, that's a very uh, important question. And people have many misconceptions when they see a Muslim lady or when they hear the word hijab in the media or different ways. People may think that hijab means the modest covering that Muslim ladies do. It oppresses them. They don't have a choice. They are forced to wear it. And that somehow limits them from being functional people in the society. Now, the modesty of clothing that women are commanded in the Quran to wear. So first and foremost, they wear it because uh, not because somebody is forcing them, because they are obeying the commands of the Creator. Present in the Quran, two places. Chapter 24, verse number 31 and onwards. And chapter 33, verse number 59. So first and foremost, they are obeying the Creator. That's the reason that they're wearing the hijab or the modest clothing. But again, just like I mentioned for the question of polygamy or polygyny, Islam did not invent it or Quran is not the first book or Islam is not the first religion to speak about the concept of modesty, by the way. I will come more to that, right? So it's very important when Muslim ladies, when they cover themselves, it is for the sake of for them obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, they want to appear or they want to be known to the society that they are Muslims and that they should not be judged by their bodies or by their physical appearances and be objectified and sexualized they should be judged by their intellect, by their personality, by their spirituality, for human beings who they are equal to man in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's number two. Number three, very important, the concept of modest clothing is not just for the females only. It's very important. Both for the males and the females, Allah, our Creator, has given equal guidance. That means for the ladies, they have to cover their whole body and they could have their face and their palms exposed. For the Muslim males, we are also supposed to cover certain parts of the body, right? At least from navel to the knees. I mean, more the better, but at least from navel to knees, number one. Number two, Muslim males and females, we cannot wear tight clothes. So it's equal again. Muslim males and females, we cannot wear transparent clothes. Equality again. Muslim males and females, we cannot wear clothes of the opposite gender. Equality again. Muslim males and females, we cannot wear extravagant clothes to waste money. Equality again. 
right, to show off and stuff, some people do it. So it, it shows the equality of hijab or modesty for both males and females, right? Number three, very important, the concept of modesty in Islam is not just limited to what we wear. It's a very holistic concept. Because the Quran says in chapter 21, verse number 30, speaking to the Muslim males, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the creator, that say to the believing males, lower your gaze and guard your modesty. That is better for you in the eyes of God. Then it comes to the females in chapter 24, verse number 31, giving them the same injunction of guarding their modesty, lowering the gaze. So it shows that in Islam, modesty is not limited to what we wear. It's a holistic term. Modesty of what we should look at, what we should not look at. Modesty of our ears, modesty of our interactions with people of opposite gender. And very important, modesty of our tongue. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, say something good or remain silent. Isn't that a profound guidance for the society? You know, I always say that if humanity, if society follows this, look at how many marriages could be saved, right? How many friendships could be saved? How many wars could be prevented? So it's a holistic concept of modesty. And since I mentioned that Islam is not the only faith that speaks about modesty, even the Jewish ladies, they're supposed to cover themselves, especially when they get married. The Christian ladies, according to the Bible, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 5 and 6, they are supposed to cover themselves wearing the hijab, especially when they are going to pray. You may have seen the Catholic nuns, right? They modestly dress themselves. Do we think they are oppressed? <laughs> right? Modestly, right? Mother Teresa. So hijab does not limit a lady, a Muslim sister, from being who she is in the society, leaders of the society. The, it does not inhibit them. In fact, you may have seen that uh, some of the wives and the believing ladies of the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, properly covered, they were the movers, the shakers, and the teachers of the society. All throughout history, you know, we gave the example of the oldest continuous university built by a Muslim lady, and she was modestly dressed. In the Olympics, by the way, there were many Muslim sisters. Yes, in the Rio Olympics 2016, many Muslim sisters wearing the hijab, they won gold, silver, and bronze medals. Example, who is that fencing champion, by the way? I can't remember her name, but I, I, I did watch her. In her. Ibtihaj Muhammad from Chicago. Not from Chicago, from the USA. She won bronze medal wearing the hijab. And she won the 2014 World Championship, number one in the world, wearing the hijab. So hijab does not limit a person. Hijab liberates a person. It's an injunction by our creator. It creates chastity, harmony, and peace in the society. And that's the concept of hijab in Islam. Modesty. Modesty. Yeah. Not just yes. how we look about everything we do. Of course. Of Mashallah. Course. So Doc, moving along here. We, on the news again, you, you see that... They watch too many news, man. Yeah, so new, well, stop watching news. <laughs> read a book. Read the <laughs> Quran. Come on. <laughs> yes, go for they, it. They, we, we have some different sects in Islam. S-E-C-T-S. -C yeah. Right? Um, namely, the Sunni and the Shia. And we see in Saudi Arabia in Yemen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. We keep hearing about the sectarian violence between these two. You know, what, could you explain that a bit okay, to sure. us? It's a common question. Sunni and Shia, who are they? Why do they fight? You know, this kind of question. It's very important that in the Quran, well, even before I mention the Quran, by the way, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was alive, he was the head of the state, and he was also a prophet. But after he passed away, in the year 632, Muslims have to elect, or they have to choose a new head of the state. Not a new prophet, by the way, because according to the Quran, chapter 33, verse number 40, <coughs> Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
is Khatamun Nabeen. He's the last and the final prophet. Right? He's the seal of the messenger. He's the seal of the prophethood. So Muslims have to choose a new head of the state. So majority of the Muslims, they want to nominate someone who was the closest to the prophet, whose name was Abu Bakr Siddiq. But some minority of the Muslims, they want to nominate equally eligible and qualified person whose name was Ali. He was from the family of the prophet. He was the son-in-law and the cousin of the prophet. It so happened that the majority who they nominated won out. And he became the very first head of the state, the very first Khalifa. That's Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, right? And Ali, by the way, he became the fourth Khalifa. He was also eligible, right? And we love and respect him as much as we do to all the companions. So the division started not from a theological perspective, but from a political perspective. Number two, very important, my dear Muslims and my dear guests, uh, in the Quran, it says in chapter number 22, verse number 78, that both before and in this, you're called as Muslims, not as Sunnis, not as Shias, but the title given to the follower of Islam is a Muslim. If somebody stops me and asks me, you know, Dr. Sabil, who are you? Are you a Sunni or are you a Shia? I would say that I am a Muslim. Muslim. Yes, that's the only title, label Allah has given to us. Number three, very important. <clears throat> Sunnis and Shias, if I have to label them that, that way, right, because of the question. We are not analogous to Catholics and Protestants and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. And this is the reason. All the Muslims, Sunnis and Shias, we have the same concept of God. We believe in the same concept of God. Unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe in Trinity. The Catholics, they believe in Trinity. So they have a different concept. Muslims are united with one concept. When you go and purchase a copy of the Quran, doesn't matter in Saudi Arabia, Iran, or in US or Trinidad, one single version of the Quran in Arabic all over the world. But if you go to Amazon.com or different Christian bookstores, there would be different versions of the Bible, not translations. Versions of the Bible means they are different in the contents. Catholic Bible, 73 books. Protestant, 66. Greek Orthodox, 78. So again, Muslims are united in one following the one version of the Quran, one and the only version. Right? Uh, the direction that we pray. All the Muslims, we pray in the direction of the Kaaba. Not to the Kaaba, but in the direction of the Kaaba. All the Muslims are united. Who is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? He's the last and the final messenger. He's not God, not son of God, no mediator. He's a human being, prophet of God. At the end of the day, all Muslims are united uh, as uh, Muslims under the banner of Islam. Last but not the least, how come there is some skirmishes, some fighting, some friction? Not because of Islam, because Islam says in chapter 3, verse number 104, that Muslims should be united, to hold, holding to the rope of Allah and not be divided. It is because of oil, historical vengeances. It is because of uh, secretarian violence and uh, land and power and greed. Just like Catholics and Protestants all throughout history in Ireland, in South Africa, in uh, Croatia and Serbia, they were fighting each other, correct? So again, at the end of the day, all people are Muslims as long as they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Name of the faith is Islam. Followers are Muslims, not Sunni, Shia, Wahhabis, one label, Muslims. Islam came not to divide, but to unite. MashaAllah. And Doc, we, well, we have approximately about two, two minutes. Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, time? <laughs> two to three minutes. <laughs> okay. Time has flown. Right. So, so this will be our final question. I am a good person. You are, mashallah. I, I hope so, inshallah. <laughs> That's what some people say. I'm a good person, but I don't pray. I should still go to paradise. Okay. All right, what's the problem with that? And then we have some non-Muslims who will also say, well, I'm a good person also, but I'm a Christian, so I should go to paradise. I'm a good person, I'm a Hindu, I should go to paradise. What, what does Islam, and how does Islam resolve that statement? Sure, sure. So it's very important. Um, there is a creator, 
he has sent us certain study guides, certain manual. So, for example, suppose if a person is going to college, there are certain core classes and certain elective classes. Suppose 20 core subjects a person has to take. He just cannot take 18 of them and say that, you know, uh, I have passed all of these. Now, let me pass the, ex uh, let me pass the class and graduate. The school may say, yes, for you to graduate, you have to complete all the classes. In the graduation, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the whole classroom. Good person is what Allah defines to be as good. To be good, we have to recite the shahada. To be good, we have to pray five times a day. To be good, we have to fulfill other fundamentals. We just we cannot say, I'm fasting, I'm giving charity, but I don't pray. We have to take all the classes and pass in them and ask forgiveness if we fall short and do what we were supposed to do. So just being a good person is not enough. Right belief and doing good deeds as defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the criteria to go to Jannah by Allah's mercy. So, yeah, alhamdulillah. Simple. Very simple, alhamdulillah. So doc, in closing, you know, I, I will allow you to say your final words, your closing remarks, you know, on, on, <coughs> on the, the questions here. Any advice further? Because there are many other questions that people will ask. And some of it will be complicated and some of it will be simple. What advice can you give to Muslims or non-Muslims when they are seeking answers? Okay, alhamdulillah. So really quickly, let's wrap up. Uh, so it's very important. There is a creator. There is a lot of evidence to it. That creator is a loving creator. He wants to guide you and me. He wants us to be in paradise and have a good life, good means. Uh, peaceful, purposeful, and solutions by God's guidance to problems. He wants us to have that kind of a life, and he wants to place us into paradise. Fulfilling the criteria, my dear Muslims and my dear uh, fellow non-Muslims, one guidance Allah has given to all of humanity through Muhammad, peace be upon him. Following this and the example of the Prophet is the way to go to paradise. Now. There can be some, many questions that may come to your mind because of the media, because of the actions of a few misguided uh, Muslims or by social media. It's important to separate the actions of Muslims from the pure teachings of Islam. This is the gold standard. So in any time when you have some doubts, some questions, go to the Quran, pick up a copy of the Quran, contact uh, IDM and uh, look up online Quran.com or gainpeace.com. Go to the source, not let any misguidance come to you. Go to the source, pray to God for guidance, and inshallah, God by His merciful guiding nature, He will guide you. And once you get guided, inshallah, once you make sincere efforts, inshallah, then you will find peace and purpose in life, and inshallah, paradise in the hereafter. Amen. Jazakallah, Dr. Sabil, and I'd like to thank all our viewers out there for, for looking at our program. If you have any questions on Islam, um, the information is on the screen. If you want a copy of the Quran, you can also contact the, the numbers on the screen and also here at IBN Studios, they distribute free English Quran, so feel free to, to contact the IDM or IBN. Okay, so I'd like to thank Dr. Sabil for, for his time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your, your efforts and you have a safe journey home. And to our viewers, um, just a reminder, the IDM Islamic Dawa movement is, a, is an organization that we deal with social and educational programs. Um, social programs, we have classes and we also have Dawa programs every week. We go out on the streets to talk to Muslims and non-Muslims about Islam.